when you read your book, um, you describe a very dark scenario, um, and actually I thought we were doomed. Well, if you speak to any scientist, they'll tell you we probably are doomed. It's just that they don't use that kind of language. So what I wanted to do really <laughs> in writing this book was to bring together the best scientific information which was available, which is in these very academic publications which no normal person can read, and translate that to a, a general audience and do so within a framework of doing one degree, two degree, three degree, and actually showing how things get worse the more we let the world warm. Since it's such a dark scenario and since you say we're doomed, why uh, does not uh, all the world leaders come together and just join in an effort to 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 to, to prevent the world. Well, that's precisely what is supposed to happen in December in Copenhagen. But you know, with all those kind of summits, uh, h how they will end. But you're not you're not suggesting that they're going to fail us for the seventeenth time in a row, are you? <laughs> They've had these annual meetings <laughs> uh, still under the auspices of the UN now for seventeen years, and uh, I'm sure they'll get one right. You, you think so? Well, eventually. I mean, it may not be this year. In fact, most of the indications are it won't be this year. Uh, I mean, it depends really on the extent to which people mobilise. Uh, it's certainly not going to happen if people don't really give a give a damn. And you, you need you need to you really need to have focused pressure from hundreds of millions of people on their leaders during the meeting to actually get an outcome. There's no point in the meeting like goldfish in a bowl with all the media glaring away and actually not having any pressure from electorates. So it's, it's the role of democracy here which is crucial. And people I don't think are quite there yet in terms of realising the singular importance of this issue in the future of their lives and the future of their children's lives and the future of the planet as a whole. Uh, people are getting there and people are pretty well informed about it now, but I don't think people have any sense of being able to do anything about it. Because it's probably so very far away, the trees are still green, um, there's still uh, gasoline for your car, you can still buy clothes, yeah. um, so <laughs> why should they care? Yeah, I mean, to make a comparison, Easter Island, which was, um, which is an island in the Pacific, and the civilization on Easter Island probably collapsed in the 17th century because they cut down all the trees. But when they were busy cutting down the trees, the lifestyle was probably really good. <laughs> so actually the better people are, people are in terms of their lifestyles, the better they are, feel, the more destructive the impact is likely to be on the planet's ecology. And so actually the sense of normality indicates how wrong things are. So, so it's, a bit, it's a bit the opposite of what you might expect. Yeah, so, so what would you suggest, except for all the millions of people coming to Copenhagen, or at least telling their leaders to do something, what would you suggest, what would help? Well, I mean, we're facing a completely intractable global problem with no obvious solution uh, in sight. I think that's a wonderful opportunity for social entrepreneurship and for uh, economic entrepreneurship. I mean, what could be more tempting than a completely intractable problem? It's something that's got people like Einstein that leap at the chance of solving a completely intractable problem. So what, what would your, your solution be? Uh, I, I think that we probably need to go back to scratch and ask what needs to happen. Rather than asking what humans can feel like they're capable of delivering, ask what the planet needs. And then let's talk about how we're going to do it. And what the planet needs is a reduction in CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere well below 350 parts per million. And that was the level that we reached in about 1985. Do you think we can go back? Do you think people are prepared to go back? No, but that's not the point. Uh, of course people aren't prepared to go back. No, 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 but that's still what the planet needs. So as a scientist, you have to say what's, what's mm -hmm. real. And um, you know, my interpretation of the science can lead to a conclusion which is completely inconvenient, but it's still the truth as I see it. So I'm not really interested in the day-to-day -day politics of... <laughs> no, but, but it's, it's, it's one thing concluding that the world is going to collapse if we don't do anything. Um, but if you want the world to uh, um, uh, stay okay, um, then you need to do something. And just saying that things are going wrong, well, that's just one step. Hmm. Oh, absolutely. 
What well, the thing I can't stand is when you see books on global warming and you get to the end and it has a list of things you can do, which are start off, change your light bulb, turn down your thermostat. I'm reading one at the moment. A really important book about biodiversity and the impacts that climate change is going to have on natural species, but it ends with the same list. And I just think, huh, you know, it, 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 I'd, I'd rather have nothing at all than be told the same list of things that's been said for years and years and years, and which you know is... It's just meaningless, really. <laughs> yes, but on the other hand, if you want to 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 peop to get people involved, you need to talk to them on a level they understand. Yes, but you can't be patronising, and you can't be boring, and you've got to, you know, engage people without lying to them. Mm -hmm. I'm in favour of just telling people the truth, and if if, if people find that's an inconvenient truth, then well, so that's not my phrase. So, um. And what do you think could be the role of social entrepreneurs in solving this, well, huge problem? Well, it's a huge opportunity for people who think differently because we're going into a different world. And people who are conservative by nature and who want everything to stay the same um, are going to be dis very sadly disappointed. So people who can grasp opportunity, remember crisis opportunity, same thing, uh, are, are going to inherit the earth and that that's going to be opportunities to make money opportunities to change the political systems opportunities to change the economic systems that we're used to and there's going to be a lot of people who get rich out of this there's going to be a lot more people who get poor but you know, the world is going to be very different and it's, it's up to the people with the best brains and the most dynamic attitude to life to to really make the running so what you're saying is that because social entrepreneurs um, tend to think in a different way, this might be a big chance for them. Yeah, there's nothing worse. If you're somebody who thinks differently from everyone else, there's nothing worse than having the world going on always the same. And so the fact that we're facing a completely different, completely different set of, uh, of influences on the future of our planet and the future of civilization is an enormous opportunity for people who think differently. To, to grasp the opportunities and to map out the future of our civilization in a way which no one today can even conceive of. So most of the time, most of the time, that's a bit sort of science fictiony. But for us, it's much, it's much more real now because it's not just about technology. It's not about building a new spacecraft or something. It's actually about everything that underpins the normality of our lives, which is energy. And this is the fundamental thing. Without energy, nothing happens. That's sort of the first law of thermodynamics, yes. almost. So changing the energy supply of civilization and actually trying to find a way for humans to declare peace with the planet that's a, an enormous opportunity and uh, if I was if I was the, some, that person who had that vision I'd be cashing in right now <laughs> I think it, it needs cleverer people than me